very soon, Lord Trimble. Thank you, and thank you to, for the invitation to come here. Um, I'm speaking as a, uh, a politician and as someone who's been engaged in a complex negotiation uh, which led to the agreement 15 years ago and its, its complexities nearly approach uh, those of, of, of the one that we're dealing with here. Uh, but I'm speaking from those two angles. Um, I used to be a lawyer, but I stopped being a lawyer in 1990, so I don't regard myself as fit to deal with any legal issues, so don't, don't, don't bother with those. But as I say, I'm, I'm speaking as a politician and someone engaged in, in a negotiation. And you'll get a copy of uh, the text that I'm going to use uh, when speaking. It's a limited text because one only has two minutes, and I'm going to take a little bit more than two minutes here. I've got two big points that I want to make about this. And the first is, when dealing with the question of uh, withdrawal from the occupied territories, it's a question of withdrawal to what? And the report that we have here uh, is quite explicit that the withdrawal should be to what is called the Green Line. The Armistice Line settled in 1948-49, uh, and uh, which is, you know, goes back right to that. It's not a border, it's not something negotiated, it just happens to be where the, the front line was when the fighting stopped in 48-49. Uh, but if you look at the, the record in terms of the uh, UN Security Council resolutions, there is nothing in the UN Security Council resolutions requiring a withdrawal to the Green Line. This is hugely important and frequently misunderstood. Resolution 242 merely talks about withdrawal to recognised and secure borders. Uh, the ceasefire line of 1947-49 was neither recognised nor secure. And the use of that terminology was deliberate. If you look at the background to the Resolution 242, uh, in the drafting of it, there was a proposal for a calling for a withdrawal to the Green Line, which was negated. And certainly the US representatives of the Security Council, and I think the UK as well, made it clear in the discussion that 242 does not require a withdrawal to the Green Line. Uh, resolution, Security Council Resolution 242 was cited by the Human Rights Council in its resolution setting up this commission, but yet the commission ignores 242 by calling for a withdrawal to the Green Line. Now, if this happened, this is a ridiculous proposition, I have to say. Uh, and one of the grotesque consequences of it is it, will be recall, it is calling for the Jewish quarter in Jerusalem to return to the state it was in in, in 1967. And that is, that is unsustainable. When the drafters of 242 called for a return to recognised and secure borders, they envisaged that there would be a negotiation to settle what would be the recognised and secure borders uh, that would be the demarcation between Israel and the surrounding Arab states. At that time, in time of 242, the notion of a Palestinian state had not come over the horizon. It has done since. But the important thing about referring to that, and this is the, the second big point I'm making, is that if we're going to have a settlement, the settlement has to be comprehensive. You can't pull out individual strands and treat them as if they're something completely distinct from all the issues. The issues interact. There has to be a comprehensive settlement. It can only be negotiated by the Israelis and the Palestinians. Other people might help, and other people might encourage, they might do some things that would help. And indeed, there are some things in the context around uh, Israel and Palestine that need to be sorted out before there's any realistic hope of an agreement. But the only people who can do the negotiations are basically the Israelis and the Palestinians. It is not, therefore, helpful to have third parties coming in, purporting to make authoritative statements, doing so over the heads of the parties, and they just make difficulties for the settlement. In fact, as I say here, for, for third parties to come in in the way that this commission has done is undermines and subverts the, any talks process. You can't have a talks process going on with people like this going around the outside. I can give you a very good illustration of this, the sort of problem that comes here. Uh, I don't know if you've come across Bob Woodward's uh, recent book, I think it's called The Price of Politics. Uh, it's about Obama's first administration, but the bulk of the book is about the negotiations in 1911 with regard to the fiscal cliff. 
You know what I mean? In 2011. In 2011. 2011. Sorry, being Irish, I live in the past. <laughs> but there we are. The, the t and the, these occupied the last four or five months of 2011. And you know some of the issues that were involved there. It was a question of like cuts, budget cuts, tax increases. And Obama was very keen to have tax increases, and the Republicans were very reluctant to concede them. But in the negotiations, as Woodward reveals, and he gives an extremely detailed account of it, uh, they, they edged to the point of an agreement which would have involved significant tax revenue increases being conceded by the Republicans. They were probably a day or two away from a, a, a complete agreement across the board when suddenly a group of four very well-minded, very well-intentioned senators, two Republicans and two Democrats, uh, decided to have a press conference and announced their, their wonderful idea for a compromise that would sort everything out. And their wonderful idea, they announced, included uh, some increases in tax revenues, which happened to be bigger than the increases that were being agreed upon bet between Obama and the Republican leadership. And that destroyed the talks. As soon as that was said, the White House came on the line and said, we can't agree to these proposals now. How can we agree to tax increases less than those two Republican senators were talking about? And the result was the talks collapsed. The congressional leaders got together, kicked the can forward for another year because they postponed it. They passed legislation very quickly to postpone the fiscal cliff to uh, January 12, uh, December 31, 12. Uh, and we've seen that it's still in play. But I just cite that, and you can see it very clearly, you know, the way in which Obama, when he found that uh, his position was being undermined by what people were doing outside, had to collapse the talks. And there's a marvelous analogy here between what Obama did in the first year of his term, when he called for a settlement freeze and then wrecked the talks going on at that stage between the Palestinians and Netanyahu. Now, th these talks have been going on from Camp David intermittently. They're not separate talks. They all stream from that. At, at Camp David, certain principles were agreed between the parties as to how they would deal with the territorial issues. And these further, you find the Camp David principles embodied in the uh, roadmap and also in the Ulmert uh, talks with the Palestinians. And when I was listening up there to people talking about uh, what's going on as something that would prevent the existence of a viable Palestinian state. That's poppycock. I mean, it is absolutely poppycock. The Allmort talks got to the point where it was possible to define a, plan, a, a line and to draw a map. And the map's in existence. It's been published. There it is. Right? Uh, and this is West Bank. These areas are settlement areas which under the, the agreement wasn't signed off, but in the talks, these were areas which would become part of Israel. And these areas here are areas of territory of Israel that is going to be transferred uh, to the Palestinian state, it's compensating transfers. And all the little triangles are settlements which will be evacuated. Right? Uh, now, that's the is Israeli version of the map. There's a slightly different version of the map pr printed in the Arab press. It's basically the same. The blue areas being areas which will be part of Israel. The dark brown areas, the compensating transfers. And all the little red dots in this map are settlements which will be evacuated. Now, that's as far as the talks have got. They didn't reach the point of a political agreement on them because, at the time, uh, the Palestinians didn't feel able to agree. Th these proposals were put by Olmert to the Palestinians. I met a, a year or so ago at a conference in Israel, a chap who was uh, Olmert's uh, right-hand man in the talks, and he told me an interesting conversation he had shortly afterwards. He met his Palestinian opposite number and said to him, you know, it's a great pity you turned down our offer. And the Palestinian re replied to him saying, you know, we didn't turn it down, we just didn't reply. They didn't feel able to agree in the situation, and I don't, I'm not blaming him. I can understand in the situation that the West Bank Palestinians are in, looking at Hamas, looking at Hezbollah, looking at the turmoil in Syria, you wouldn't want to, to do a settlement now unless you knew what the context was. So I can well understand why they don't feel able to agree and why they go off to the UN in what is essentially displacement activity. And we've got a bit more displacement activity up here. But to, to say that we're in a situation where Israel is refusing 
to deal with the settlement issue when it has put proposals on the table to do that, but they have to be part of a comprehensive agreement. They can't be done as a result of an outside party coming in like this. and saying, they, By coming in like this way and saying it has to be back to the green line, they cut the ground underneath the Palestinians. How can the Palestinians agree to something which is less than the green line if you've got these people running around? And they should know that 242 does not refer to withdrawal to the Green Line. So I wonder, you know, what is the reason for doing this? They're engaged in activity, which I said, I'm going to say to them, that what they're doing can only undermine and subvert the peace process. Why do that? Their role should be that of being supportive. The UN, in fact, actually is supposed to be part, of, it's one of the elements in the quartet. They're engaged in this dialogue. So they must know what is going on. But then, of course, the United Nations Human Rights Council is a slightly different creature. I do end up by referring to the criticism of the uh, UN Human Rights Council made by successive uh, UN uh, S Secretaries General Annan and Ban Ki-moon, which referred to, both of them referred to this council's habit of singling out one specific country, one specific set of issues, to the virtual exclusion of everything else. And one might ask the question, why do they behave in this way? Why, do, why this imbalance? Why is it constantly focusing on, on and focusing in a not particularly helpful way, on the uh, Israeli-Palestinian issue and not looking at other issues which are just as meaningful and just as important? Because unfortunately what they're doing in their focus on the Israeli-Palestinian issue is not advancing the settlement. Indeed, if anything, it's, it's a, impeding it. Now that's an expanded version of my little page, and I'll, I'll stop here and I see some people want to respond. I'll just ask, of course, if you join in the time. John Hopper, Associated Press. Um, how do you think what occurs here will uh, affect uh, Obama's upcoming visit, at which uh, settlement talks will no doubt come up? Well, Obama, in his first uh, came over the horizon, he was calling for a, a settlement freeze actually got a settlement freeze for a period of time. Um, he, Obama should know all about this because on Obama's staff is a gentleman who was deeply involved in the uh, Camp David talks uh, and so he should know all about this background and hopefully he'll be looking at it. Um, he might also like to bear in mind that there's a big difference between announcements by Israeli ministries of settlement plans and actual settlements occurring. There's a huge time uh, gap, and there's also a, a, a complete disjunction between the numbers in ish announced at one stage and the numbers that actually appear. So I hope Obama takes that into account. But really, if Obama's going to, he, he needs to show that he's going to be uh, informed and even-handed. And I think he needs to address himself to the issue of what's going to happen in Egypt and what's going to happen in Syria, because I don't see how you can settle things uh, in the Palestinian areas until you know the context and that they know the context, the Palestinians at the end of the day are going to have to take a very difficult decision because it will mean recognition of the existence of the Israeli state. And they can't do that while their neighbours are refusing to recognise, when you've got some, Morsi, the Egyptian president, with the things he's said in the past, when you've got people in, in Syria who are closely allied with Iran, which talks about wiping out the state of Israel. This is not an easy context for Palestinians to, as it were, come out and, and take out what might be a lonely furrow by recognising the existence of Israel. They need, Palestinians will need to be supported by the major Arab neighbours in taking this decision. And I don't think we can put the responsibility on them to carry all this burden themselves. They need to see support from elsewhere. Now, Saudi Arabia with its Arab, uh, the Arab peace plan of some years ago is in the same sort of territory and I would hope that they would, in fact, I think discreetly the Saudi Arabians have been helpful, but they're not in the habit of sticking, coming over the, the, the horizon first in these matters. Other people, I think, will have to do that. Now, Obama could help by encouraging all that. Okay, Jonathan Fowler from AFP. Do you think uh, there's, uh, there are any lessons that you can draw from, from the Northern Ireland peace process for the Middle East peace process? Uh, well, I mean, one of the mantras we use in Northern Ireland is nothing's agreed until everything's agreed. Uh, and it's part of the reason why one says you can't put out one strand and deal with it independently from the other strands. Uh, they, do inter they do interact with each other. Context is also important. 
uh, we would never have had a settlement in Northern Ireland unless uh, there, uh, without there having been, uh, as it were, a good working relationship between London and Dublin. And that's why I'm coming back to the context around uh, Israel and Palestine. That needs to be of the right context. Uh, we would never have had an agreement in Northern Ireland. Way back in the early 1970s, there was a time when the, the Irish government looked as though it was supporting the activities of the most extreme elements in, in, in nationalist Northern Ireland, namely the IRA. Uh, and there was no hope of getting anything settled in that context. We, the, the Irish now that was in the early 70s. Later, the Irish government came into a very different position and a very much more helpful one. And that facilitated uh, the, the agreement. But the agreement still had to be made between uh, ourselves and our opposite numbers in the, in, in, you know, in, in the Northern nationalist community. So, I mean, I'm, I'm dealing with those big process issues. And I think that's, th those are things where uh, but they're fairly obvious, and um, I think the parties uh, in Israel and Palestine know that these are things that are necessary. Uh, two um, Who are you with, sir? Jerry Rose from Action Press. Um, how do you see the, the following up with the peace process in Egypt uh, because of Morsi's philosophy or attitude? Well, the, the comments of Morsi that are referred to are a couple of years ago. Um, he hasn't had any general statements on, the, on these grounds since then. Uh, the Egyptians were very helpful in hel helping to resolve matters in, uh, in, in getting a ceasefire in Gaza, and that was helpful. Um, there were, had been earlier some hopeful signs in Gaza. It looked as though at some stage that Gaza, Hamas, uh, was beginning to look more to Egypt for uh, guidance and support than look to Hezbollah uh, and beyond. Uh, and that would be very helpful. Uh, I mean, indeed, in a sense, it would be natural for Hamas to look in that direction because Hamas is an offshoot of the, the, uh, the Muslim Brotherhood, which has its origins in, in, in Egypt. So it would be natural for uh, the uh, Gaza, Hamas and Egypt to look together. And if that meant uh, that Morsi was supporting them in, you know, devoting themselves to political action and to advancing their interest through uh, negotiations. They will have noticed a very interesting thing on one of these maps. Well, like one of the things in these agreements was in involved a land at link between Gaza and the West Bank, which is a hugely important thing from the point of view of creating a viable Palestinian state. Uh, so, I mean, there, there are things there, and, and the economic data that is in the UN Watch's paper will deal with the very significant increase there has been in economic prosperity within uh, the Gaza area in recent years. They had two years when they were growing at the rate of 15 per cent. Now, they're not growing at quite that rate at the moment. They're down to about 7 per cent. But, I mean, uh, all of Europe would give its right arm for growth at half that rate at the moment. Oh yes, yes, yes. The West Bank's been doing well as well. Now, um, a lot of this is due to international help, uh, and it's due to the activities of the quartet. And, and Tony Blair has been the uh, representative of the quartet for economic development in, in those areas. But a huge amount of it has been due to the Palestinian Prime Minister Fayyad, uh, who has transformed uh, the, the the Palestinian Authority uh, in, in a way which it needs to be transformed because there, there can't be a viable Palestinian state until we do have uh, effective, uh, you know, uh, the, the elements of an effective administration, which wasn't there before Fayyad and Fayyad is putting out there. Fayyad's uh, emphasis on state building <coughs> is something that actually needs to happen in the Palestinian territories in order to make them viable. And that's actually probably more important than arguments about whether they, 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 the line will be 100 yards this direction or 100 yards the other direction. Yeah. Now, last, uh, second part of the question was, what is your opinion about uh, the DEPCA files information, see if you know that? It's the what? DEPCA. It's a uh, Israeli uh, news agency called DEPCA. It's a w it's a website. I don't think it's a news agency, but it's, it's a website that it, that has ideas about things. Well, but you tell me what what is it about Debka that you think I should know? 
where the logo is, uh, we, we start with the new stuff. So. Uh. It, it, it's a website that claims to have inside knowledge with the Israeli security services, and, and it has interesting headlines, but they don't always oh, right. okay. have a basis in, in, uh, in fact. Ishiguro, what is the overall impact of the Arab Spring over these uh, two-state solutions? After the Arab Spring in the region, more and more, the radical Islamist is more influential in Egypt, Tunisia. Maybe in Syria, after the collapse of the Assad, the radical Islamists may control the country. What is this uh, strengthening of Islamism? The, the, the people who started the, the Arab Spring, the people who in Tunisia and Egypt uh, were trying to get an end to the dictatorship and trying to get you know, a, a, you know, a representative system of government present uh, and to enhance diplomatic personal freedom, uh, those people were not hoping to enfranchise extreme radical uh, Islamists. Uh, I think I would just wait and see what happens. Um, the Morsi administration does have its roots in the Muslim Brotherhood, but the Egyptian Muslim Brotherhood has been saying quite some interesting things over the last few years about where it is. Now, there's a degree of ambiguity about this. And one of the things about finding yourself in office is that you then have to deal with the realities around you rather than with your ideology. And this usually has a very uh, significant educative effect. Uh, or development effect on, on people who find themselves in, in office. Uh, now, Morsi has got uh, his challenges, and I wouldn't just assume that uh, things are going to just simply go drift in one particular way. Uh, I see that when some Islamists tried to hijack parts of the uh, of Libya, uh, that the, the particular around Benghazi, uh, the local population very quickly asserted themselves. And one of the things that has been very clear throughout the Arab world as a whole is that while Islamists have some support, they do not have widespread popular support anywhere. So um, I, I, I just wouldn't be, you know, the, there is a degree of uncertainty as about where the cards are going to fall in Syria and Egypt. And until that uncertainty is removed, I can't see anybody in between taking any firm decisions. Uh, but I wouldn't be I wouldn't be just assume that things are going to you know, inevitably drift in the ro in, in a direction which not be would, would not be helpful. But we'll have to just wait and see. Gentlemen um, at the back. You know what? Actually, I think we have to speak. I think we have to go. Oh, do we? Oh, I apologize. Mr. Bill has to address the council. So uh, thank you all for coming.